the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Menadad, Menadad the father of Nash, and Nash the father of Solomon, and Solomon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by wife of Uriah, Solomon the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, Abijah the father of Asaph, Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. And Joram, the father of Uzziah. And Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. And Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. And Manasseh, the father of Amos. And Amos, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation of Babylon. And after the deportation of Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud. Abiud, the father of Elikim. And Elikim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Ahaz. He the father of Elijah, Elijah the father of Eliezer, Eliezer the father of Matha, Matha the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Joseph, Joseph, husband of Mary, whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Ahab to David were 14 generations. From David to the deportation of Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's bow for a word. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. It is amazing. It tell, even though these genealogies sometimes put people to sleep, it shows us that Jesus Christ was indeed real. He indeed had a real royal lineage, and he is indeed the Jewish Messiah. Uh, Lord, help us to take these truths to heart uh, as we come before your word this morning. Open it up to us. Help us understand it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, while many Jews look favorably to Jesus of Nazareth today, uh, many view Christianity as anti-Semitic. You know, I remember going to the uh, Jewish, uh, the Holocaust Museum over in St. Louis, Missouri, and we actually had a Holocaust survivor, and I didn't know any better, I was pretty ignorant, but I heard her talk about Jesus, and she said... Jesus the prophet said this, Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Isn't that an amazing, wonderful thing? And I was just taken aback because she called Jesus a prophet. And if Jesus is a prophet, then what he said was true. And so I asked her if she was a Messianic Jew, and to my English teacher's uh, dismay, I just dared ask the most horrible question. She just politely said, "No, I'm just. I just. We just view him highly as a prophet." And that's very strange. But then I found out later that friends like my friend Andrew Rapport were trained to believe that Christianity was a religion of the Nazis, and many of them believe that the New Testament was a book that trained you on how to persecute Jews. But to his dismay, as to many Jewish converts' dismay, Jesus Christ was indeed Jewish. His disciples were Jewish. The New Testament referred to Jewish prophecies about the Jewish Messiah, and that Christianity was started by the Jews. You see, Matthew wrote his gospel to Jews. To show that Jesus is indeed the Jewish Messiah, through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So he's not just the God of the Jews only, but he's the God of the Gentiles. Jesus is the long way Jewish Messiah, through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed and saved. We see a little bit of Jesus' history here. It says, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. You see, when we get the word genealogy, many times it's actually the word history. If you look at reading the book of Genesis, every time it says this is the genealogy of, it refers to history. And sometimes they give a genealogy, and sometimes it gives a, uh, an account. Like, the genealogy of the heavens and the earth refers to 
the creation of the heavens of the, uh, of the earth, and also the creation of Adam and Eve before they go into the garden. When it says these are generations of Adam and Eve, it talks about uh, it talks about his genealogy, traces his line now all the way down to Lamech, and then it says this is the genealogy of Lamech, and it talks about Noah and the great flood. You see. Genealogies in the Bible were meant to give real history. You see, it also was supposed to connect the readers to God's promises to the fathers. You see, it says in the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, it points back to Jesus' prophecy in 2 Samuel 7. When it says that God would establish a king on the throne of David. And he would build him a house. And that house would not fall. And if he sins, he would be beaten with the rods of men. But if he repents, he will, he, he will be saved. And also, through the blessing of David, of the Messiah would also come the promise from Abraham when he promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. He said, Abraham, I will surely bless you and make you into a great nation and in your seed or in your offspring, referring to a singular offspring, a singular seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And this would have brought to the Jewish mind all the promises that were promised of the Messiah through David and also the promise and blessings of Abraham. And he starts with Abraham. He looks to Jesus' family. And Matthew here lists three movements throughout Israel's history. You see Abraham to David and then David to Josiah and the, deep, and the deportation to Babylon. And then from the deportation of Babylon to the time of Christ. You see, the, the, the list from Abraham to Jesse and David reminds them of, the, of God's miraculous foundation for Israel. And how God personally talked to Abraham. And he personally talked to Isaac and Jacob and he, he and the promise of the of the Messiah through Judah, and then it goes down from Judah and his illicit affair with uh, Tamar and her having twins by him, and he did he was Judah was doing something wrong, and ta and Tamar was a Gentile, probably a Canaanite. That's a great thing for growing your lineage, a Canaanite woman. When you're a Jew, when you're a, Gen, when you're a Jew, you see Gentiles were scum of the earth. Gentiles were people who didn't have the promises of God. They were going to go directly to hell. But hey, this was one of the ancestors of David. In fact, almost the majority of people who were descended from Judah had Canaanite ancestry because of Tamar. And through, and through her, she had Perez. And then he begat children, and they begat children. And then they go to Rahab. Rahab was another Gentile prostitute. She wasn't just a Gentile, she was a prostitute. A woman who was considered completely worthless. But she believed in the promise of God to the Israelites. And she hid the spies. And they were saved by her. And God granted her to be in the Messiah's ancestry. So, obviously, even back then, during the time of the patriarchs, during the time of the Exodus, during the time of the Canaanite conquering, through the time of the judges, God was allowing Gentiles to be part of God's people. Everyone who repented of their idolatrous ways and believed in the promises of God and entered into His covenant would be saved. 
And so Tamar was saved. Rahab was saved. And Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. And the Moabites were not allowed to enter into the covenant of the kingdom of Israel. But God allowed Ruth the Moabite to be the great grandmother of David. And so the great, 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 great grandmother would add a few extra greats, the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we see from David to Josiah, even down to the deportation, we see it would have reminded the Jews of God's promise, God's provision to Israel during Israel's height. The monarchy of, of Israel was the height of the nation. They had a king on the throne. And these kings governed the people. David was a man after God's own heart, and he led the people rightly. And so Solomon, till, till the end of his life, he was a man after God's own heart, till he acquired a thousand wives, 700 wives, 300 concubines. And then he turned the kingdom partially away from God. And Rehoboam, the son, split the kingdom. And then Abijah started to turn back to God. And we have, we have several, we have about seven good kings. Seven or eight good kings in the Old Testament. From David to Josiah, Josiah being the last good king of, it, of, of Judah. We also had bad kings like Manasseh, who sacrificed his son on the altar. We also see bad kings like Amos, the father of Josiah, who led the, led the Israelites in idolatry. But this was still the height of Israel's power, the monarchy, because through, through this period, God appointed prophets he did miracles of saving Israel from their enemies. He did all kinds of wonderful things, even though Israel was not following God's way. And, he still, and God still brought up good kings to try to lead people to repentance, but the people didn't repent. And so they were sent away into Babylonian captivity around 600 years before Christ. And then after the deportation of, to Babylon, where Israel was in its exile at its lowest, there was no king in Israel from the time of the deportation of Babylon till Christ came on the scene. And the deportation to Christ would have reminded the Jews of God's promises to the Jews and provision through the years of silence. We see Ezra written during this time, Daniel Ezekiel was written during this time, and even the book of Malachi was written, the last book of the Old Testament was written during this time. And only Zerubbabel is mentioned here in the Old Testament, where God said that he would bless Zerubbabel. It's an amazing, amazing thing. And then it lists. Through the silent years, though God was not speaking to prophets after Malachi, there was 400 years of silence. But it shows these names here, and it shows that God was providing, that he was still preparing for the seed to come, the promised Messiah to come to the people. And it came through all of these men. And then finally, Joseph, the husband of Mary, whom Jesus was born, who was called Christ. God was providing from the foundation, through Israel's height, through Israel's lowest point, he was preparing for the Christ to come. And I think this is an amazing thing. So we're going to look at these four, at these three four, four teams here. It says, it's clear that Jesus is referring to three complete periods. From Abraham to David, 
is a complete period from David to the deportation of Babylon is a complete period. And then from the deportation of Babylon to Christ was, is a complete period. These three main periods of Israelite history that would have brought all these wonderful promises to mind. The Israelites were think, or would have been thinking about this. You see, some commentators, when they look at these, at these, this fourteen, the fourteen generations, they 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 know that David's name makes up the word fourteen in Hebrew. You see, every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has a number associated with it, and so these. We're okay with her. Um, she's a very beautiful baby. And my kids were making a scene earlier. So she is a-okay. Not being embarrassed. But these, this, anyways, the Hebrew numbers associated with the Hebrew letters would have added up to 14. And so they would call it a special term called a grammaticon. And so they think that the genealogy is centered around David. But other people think 14 was a special number in Jewish minds, referring to complete eras like Moses' temple priests to the from Moses to the temple priests. But I think the context makes the case that just Jesus just came at the perfect time to end Israel's exile and to usher in the Messianic kingdom. You see, Matthew proves Jesus is the Messiah in his genealogy. He gives his legal credentials to being the king. Jesus' bloodline from the line of Joseph goes all the way back from Abraham, is able to trace it down to David, and then from, from David he's able to trace it all the way down to Joseph. So when Joseph adopted Jesus as his son, Jesus had the legal right to sit on the throne of Israel. The legal right, according to God. So he is the Messiah according to the genealogy Matthew provides. Jesus came at the perfect time to end Israel's spiritual exile and usher in the messianic promise of God's eternal kingdom and the blessings of God for all nations. If it wasn't for those promises, if it wasn't for Jesus being the Jewish Messiah, you and I would not be here today. You know, some of us like to think that we're better than other groups of people. Much like the Jews thought they were better than everybody else on earth. They thought that they were God's chosen special people because God sent them the prophets, He sent them the scriptures, and through them came the Messiah. And they were in that sense. But they weren't the only ones going to heaven. Because God is the God of the Jews and He's God of the Gentiles. Whether you worship Muhammad, whether or Muslims don't worship Muhammad, they actually worship Allah through Muhammad. So whether you worship Allah, whether you worship Buddha, whether you worship Mary. Whether you worship the teachings of Joseph Smith, even though you worship those, those false idols, God is still your God, and you will be accountable to Him on Judgment Day for following idols and the false teachings of these false religions. The pagans that are babbling at the sky, the pagans that are babbling at their science, they're all going to have to face God on Judgment Day because God is rightfully their God. If they don't acknowledge Him as that, they are going to be thrown in hell forever. That's a very crazy, scary thing. Our culture likes to try to teach us tolerance. They want us to be tolerant of everybody but Christians. Ever notice that? Our culture says, you know, we need to be tolerant of Muslims. Maybe tolerant of Jews to a certain extent, except those people in Israel. We may be tolerant of Muslims, we may be tolerant of Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, but those right wing 
Bible-thumping wing nuts. They, they're on the wrong side of history. Well, I'll tell you what, we may be on the wrong side of their history, but we're on the right side of God. Because Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, but His promises are for everyone. You see, everybody has a big problem. We have a sin problem. You see, God is good, and He cannot let sin go unpunished. He is God in heaven. He is perfect. He is amazing. He, he is holy, holy, holy. He is the most amazing thing in all creation. Above all creation. But because we have sinned against God's perfect, holy will. We have sinned against God. You and I deserve eternal judgment and damnation. We have all told a lie. Told countless lies. It makes us all liars. We've take, taken things that are not ours without permission. That makes us thieves. We've Use God's name in vain, in vain. That's called blasphemy. Very serious in God's eyes. We've looked at lust. We've coveted. We've been angry. we murdered people in our hearts. We've done all these horrible, evil things. And we deserve God's holy wrath and His holy anger against us. We deserve that. We deserve hell. But God, in His mercy, throwing our high points, our foundations, High points and our low points. God was preparing for a promise to come so that we could all be saved. And that is the man, the God man, our Lord Jesus Christ. We worship Him. We're supposed to be worshiping every, every day, but we worship Him on Christmas, realizing, remembering that He came, became a man. He was God who became a man, still being God, but became a man, so he could live a perfect life, being born of really humble means, being born a man. He lived, he lived this perfect, sinless life, even though he had nothing to his name. And he called us, he taught us God's will, he did miracles, he healed us, he bore our diseases. Yeah, we didn't care about him. We considered him nothing. We even hated him because he called us evil. And he died on a cross bearing our sin. So that God could punish him for our sin. And God could legally dismiss the case of everyone who repents and trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what we celebrate as, as we have our, our Christmas meal together, remember that God, throughout all history, since before the fall of man, He knew we would fall. He knew, he knew we would sin. He already provided a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just bringing Him into history. He's always been preparing us for that moment. That He would come and save us. Jesus wasn't plan B. He was plan A. Always planning. So that we would, would be able to worship God. He'd be bought back by God. You know, today, I got a visit from a, from a young man who said that he had, he was suffering from a bite on his arm. Uh, he said it was a brown recluse bit him. And he didn't seem like he was really in pain, but he was asking for gas money. I said, I I'm not going to give you gas money. I'll pay for your. I'll go with you and pay for your gas. And so I drove over to Flat Rock to go pay for his gas today. But I didn't leave him without the gospel. This lady came out that slammed the door in my face after going door to door. She came out and apologized to me over what she had done, I said, I forgive you. And I do that because, you know, we're all sinners. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God is good, we are not. We've all lied and stolen, used God's name in vain, and we've all, we all deserve to go to hell for all eternity. But 
God sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's fully God and fully man, to die on the cross and rise from the dead so that, our, so that He could legally dismiss our sin and our case and give us, make us good. All we need to do is cry out to Him for salvation, turn from our sin, and trust in Him. And if you do that, get baptized and join a local church. And I, I told, said that to all four of them in that car, and then they drove off. I don't know what God's going to do with that, but that's the message of the gospel. I did that today with all the hectic stuff going on. I, I was behind in making a PowerPoint slide. I was behind in turning on the lights on and getting the cameras out and everything. But I did that because I believe that Jesus is the Messiah that will save his people from their sins. And you need to go and do likewise. If you, this guy comes asking you for money, try not to give him money if you can, uh, unless he, you know, he's not going to, unless he's going to use it for what he says, uh, because he could use that for drugs. But if somebody comes up to you and asks you for help, help them out and share the gospel with them. And we come up across that stuff all the time. Or we see somebody sitting around being bored. You know what's better? To pass the time and share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, let's, let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you that you sent Jesus Christ to be born of a virgin through and be born from the Davidic line so that we, would, we could all be saved. Lord, as we go and eat today, uh, please bless the food to nourish your bodies to do your will. Help us to, as we go out today, to go share the gospel with everyone. All will listen. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>